Welcome to a Rice University digital media production. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Susan McIntosh, the director of Ciencia, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture in our continuing series this year on failure. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here. Now, in the past lectures, we've looked at failures of visual perception, voting machine failures, medical error, failure to attain hoped for levels of personalized medicine, and the poetics of failure in art and literature. I am not sure that in any of these cases, the failures involved reached epic scale. <laughs> Today, uh, we will find out about some in physics that do, and why that makes this an especially exciting, rather than an especially depressing time to be doing physics. Our speaker today works on experimental particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. This facility is perhaps best known to the American public at large for the hype that surrounded its startup in 2008 based on the fears of some highly publicized critics that the colliding protons could create a black hole that would swallow up the Earth. As we know, this failed to happen. <laughs> which uh, could perhaps be viewed in a perverse way as failure on an epic scale. <laughs> and I'm hoping perhaps Professor Padley will divulge whether he had any hand in this massive failure, since he is the leader of a group of around 100 physicists from 10 universities that operates a key component of one of the LHC detectors with the purpose of maximizing its physics performance. His experiments in high energy particle physics at several of the world's leading particle physics facilities, most recently the LHC, are aimed at understanding the basic constituents of matter and the laws of nature that govern them. In just the past two years, he and his collaborators on the compact muon solenoid team have published two dozen reports on the results of collision experiments at the LHC. He has also been active in bringing physics to the wider public, contributing to an episode of The Magic School Bus, serving as a consultant to other programs, including the Alley Theater's uh, production of Hapgood, and appearing on the Discovery Channel. We're delighted to have Paul Padley with us today to speak on failure on an epic scale, the excitement of physics yesterday and today. Paul. So thank you for the introduction. And you can, you can imagine the thrill when Susan contacted me and said, Paul, as you know, we're having a Scientia lecture series that's uh, all about failure. And your experiment broke, and you will destroy the planet. If anybody on this campus knows about failure, you do. So I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Well, but the funny thing is, she was right. We physicists know all about failure. And in this talk, I'm going to give you some examples. We're going to look at some examples of failed apparatus and failed theory. I'm going to present some of that in a historical context. This is Scientia. We mix history and philosophy and science. And I'm going to try and do that. And I'm going to discuss some potential failures that may happen in the near future. And I wanted to start going back in history to the great physicist Albert Michelson. And Albert Michelson was a fantastic builder of instruments. Uh, his most famous instrument is now called the Michelson interferometer. And for its day, it was a phenomenal piece of apparatus. So in the 19th century, Michelson with his interferometer could measure things with a precision of one one hundred thousandth of a millimeter. Okay, and think about how fantastic that, fantastic that is, to be able to measure things with such precision. And it was such a big success and not a failure that Michelson got the Nobel Prize in 1907 for his optical precision instruments and 
for all the great advances that were able to be done with those instruments. And one of the things you can do with a Michelson interferometer is measure the speed of light. And I just want to show you a little applet off the web that shows you how that works. So here, here's a cartoon of a Michelson interferometer. And basically what you have is a beam of light that you bounce around. And you pass through a material, a, a tube containing a gas. And while you, the speed of light in that gas will change according to how much gas is in that tube. And so if we look and see what happens when we change the amount of gas in the tube, and this is a simulation, but it really works this way, you see very dramatic changes in this interference pattern that comes about from those light beams interfering. Okay, so this is, this is a phenomenal tool for measuring things with precision on a fraction of a wavelength of light. And this was a wonderful advance technologically. Now, at that time in the 19th century, people knew that light was a wave and they figured something must be oscillating and so it was widely accepted that there was an ether. And it was the ether that carried the light waves. And if the ether is filled with this ether, then the Earth should be moving through it. So Michelson, with Morley, began to try and measure the relative motion of the Earth through the ether. And the way to think of this is think of a swimmer swimming across a river or swimming with and against the flow of a river. And how fast they go will depend on what direction they're swimming across the river or with the river. Okay, so by trying to do that with his interferometer, Michelson hoped to measure the speed of the Earth moving through the ether. So here's a cartoon of the experiment. This is you know, exactly what I showed you before. And they put the experiment on a big rotating table. So if the Earth is moving through the ether in this direction, and I have a big table, and I see my interference pattern, then as I turn the table, I should see those fringes change, just like I showed you in that simulation. And here's a picture of the table. And the experiment was a complete and total failure. Michelson and Morley were not able to measure a changing speed of light. There was no motion through the ether that they could detect. They failed to make that measurement. Since then, many people have tried to repeat the experiment and every single time you fail to measure a speed of light variation with direction through an ether. And it was Einstein who came along and made sense of all this. Einstein said, the ether has nothing to do with it. It's simply a consequence of two postulates, and I'm going to paraphrase those two postulates. The laws of physics take the same form in all inertial frames. An inertial frame just means you're moving with a constant uh, speed or velocity. And Galileo basically had thought of that. And then Maxwell's equations. We know that light waves are created by electromagnetism, and the equations that generate uh, electromagnetism are Maxwell's equations. And you can derive that light travels with a constant speed and vacuum from Maxwell's equations. It was there all the time for people to see, but people had failed to notice that that was a property of Maxwell's equations. Now, there were some consequences to these two postulates. So your concepts of space and time have to change. Space and time become malleable things. They aren't the nice rigid things that we would like to think about them as being. Um, but from those two postulates, you derive relativity. It's been shown to be correct many different ways. And so we now accept that, in fact, Maxwell's equations were right, and the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant, and neither has any, nothing to do with it. So what's the summary of this failure? So Michelson builds great instruments. He uses this to measure the speed of the Earth passing through the ether and fails to do so. Turns out solutions of Maxwell's equations are correct, and part of what that, one of the consequences of that is that our concepts of space and time have to change as a result. But that's great. That's a pretty good failure. Now, at around the same time, in the same era, there was something called black body radiation that was being measured. 
And anybody with a temperature, and that includes you and me, this room, emits electromagnetic radiation. And people in the 19th century were able to use interferometers to measure the emitted light and notice the following. What they noticed was a distribution of the intensity of the light being emitted as a function of wavelength. And that distribution is shown here. And it's a very clear distribution. Lots of people reproduced it. Then you take Maxwell's equations and some other physics, and you try to understand this distribution. And what you get is this blue line. Maxwell's equations and the known physics of that day predict a distribution of the wavelengths of light that is a complete failure. In fact, is referred to as the ultraviolet catastrophe. So there was something wrong with Maxwell's equations that couldn't explain this. And, and Planck comes up with the mathematical solution. He says, if, if materials absorb and emit, re-emit light in discrete quanta with an energy equals h times some constant times their frequency, then you can explain that spectrum. But Planck thought this was some property of the black body radiators. And that actually was a wrong idea. And there were other experiments, most importantly the photoelectric effect, that were also inconsistent with classical physics. And so someone came along and sorted that out. And you'll recognize this guy. <laughs> so the same year that Einstein told us that Maxwell's equations were correct, predicted a speed of light that was a constant in a vacuum, and uh, thereby gave rise to the special theory of relativity. He also published a paper explaining the photoelectric effect in black body ra radiation, which proved that Maxwell's equations are wrong and classical physics are wrong. <laughs> and the explanation is that there are photons, and light's not comprised of waves, but rather of photons. And this is the beginning of quantum mechanics. So summary of this failure is there was great experiments done that measured the black body spectrum. Theoretical physics of the day failed to explain this phenomenon. And quantum mechanics is invented successfully to explain this and other phenomena that were being measured in experiments. And you get an additional failure as a bonus. Okay? We get two descriptions of reality, waves and particles. Everything is both at the same time. Maxwell's equations are right. Maxwell's equations are wrong. It depends how you look at things. This is a stunning success. Now, in, in the process, you have to throw out things like causality and causal logic. Um, yikes. And to this day, we don't even understand what that means when I say those words. Nobody really understands in a deep level what quantum mechanics is. We fail to understand it. But boy, it sure works well to many significant figures. OK, so that was the more distant past. And now I was going to talk a little bit about something more recent that has a Rice and a Houston connection. So um, Robert Wilson and Arne Opensis uh, did a great experiment. And Robert Wilson went to Lamar High School, which is just not far from here. And then he attended Rice University. And then after graduating from Rice, he studied radio astronomy in graduate school. And he hooked up, uh, I guess that's the wrong words these days. <laughs> he then worked with Arno Penzias at Bell Labs. And the first thing you can ask is, why is Bell Labs hiring radio astronomers? Well, Bell Labs was interested in building antennas that could be used to communicate with satellites. And they wanted radio antennas to look out and communicate with satellites. And one thing radio astronomers are really good at is building antennas that look out into space and get radio signals. So, they, so Wilson and Penzias got a deal where they could work half time on antennas for talking to satellites, and then half the time working on doing radio astronomy. So they were there as radio astronomers as the first love, but the technology had great applications to Bell Labs. So they build this tremendous microwave receiver to look at microwaves from space, a phenomenal instrument. And this was state of the art when it was built. And something seemed to be failing. 
there was always noise in the apparatus. There was something going wrong. There was some apparent failure with their apparatus. And it turned out there was some noise in the apparatus that seemed to cor correspond to a black body radiator, what we just talked about, that had a temperature of 3 degrees Kelvin. So they were very confused about what was going on. They start systematically, they spend a year going through their apparatus carefully, painstakingly looking for sources of noise. They get the pigeon droppings out of the antenna. Pigeons had roosted inside it, and they could not make the noise go away. And then talking to theorists, they actually realize this was real noise. This was the noise of the universe. What they were seeing was the ambient temperature of the universe left over from the Big Bang. So there had been a Big Bang, and since the Big Bang, the universe has been cooling down, and it's now cooled down to about 3 degrees Kelvin. And that's what they were seeing in their microwave antenna. So a tremendous accomplishment. So a Rice graduate did really well. Gets a Nobel Prize. My high school career was undistinguished except for math and science. However, barely being admitted to Rice University. So nothing's changed in admissions <laughs> since he came. Uh, I found I enjoyed the courses and the elation of success and graduated with honors in physics. So one of the lessons we learn is that our admissions people maybe fail to identify the best candidates as undergraduates. Uh, Wilson did pretty good. Now there was another thing. So when I was looking for where my kids were going to go to high school, um, I visited Lamar High School, and they talked about all the famous people that went there, like Tommy Toon, and they had this whole list of actors and that. And then there's an afterthought this year, and here's some you might not, have thought, uh, might not know about. Robert Wilson, and you know, there's some other people that like, made great achievements in science. Okay, so what's the summary of this failure? Some great radio telescope instrumentation was built. Turns out it had noise they can't make, away, make go away, but that noise, it turns out, is really, really important. They're listening to the birth of the universe with that noise. Pretty good. Okay, so let's go to a double failure, again with the Rice connection. The Hubble Space Telescope. So we all know about the Hubble Space Telescope. I don't know how many of you know, the younger people maybe not, is Bob O'Dell, who was the project scientist for the Hubble Space T Telescope. He was in charge of getting it built between 1972 and 1982. In 1982, he came to Rice and became a faculty member here. And of course, most of us have probably heard that there was a problem with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's very interesting to talk to Bob O'Dell about that. Uh, because I've managed big projects, actually how big projects fail is a topic of interest to me. And it, and it was a classic problem. So if you look at a picture of the, look, take some time. So you've all seen the Hubble Space Telescope. Go look for a picture of a spy satellite. It will look remarkably like this. In fact, the optical systems on the Hubble Space Telescope Hubble Space Telescope is a spy satellite turned around looking outwards. And, and they weren't expecting the optics to be difficult. It had been done lots of times before. They thought gyroscopes, I mean, they had to hold on to an image for a long time. So they were all distracted, worrying about gyroscopes and things like that. And they missed that there was a problem making the mirror. So the Hubble was launch, launched with a serious flaw in the mirror. And it got a lot of bad press, um, much of it undeserved, because even with the flaw, it was one of the most fantastic instruments ever launched. It was a tremendous instrument and was able to do fantastic science, even with the optics flaw. Um, it's since been fixed with corrective optics, like many of us in the audience have been. And it's now even a better instrument. So that was an interesting instrumental failure, not a complete failure. But Hubble's had even a bigger failure. Now, Hubble was called, the Hubble Space Telescope was called that in part because it was named after the great astronomer Hubble. But in fact, one of the primary purposes of the Hubble Space Telescope was to measure the Hubble constant better than had ever been done before. And the way they do this is they go and look at supernovae, and by studying supernovae, um, measuring how they 
light from them dims with, dims with time. They can make estimates of how far away an object is. And from that, provide, get a measure of the distance. And then they can look at redshift and get a measure of the distance. And that. And so you know, here's an example of a supernova. So we particle physicists are always jealous of the astronomers and their cool pictures. So we try to work some of their pictures into our talks. And so this is my example. So these supernovas are great yardsticks that allow us, by measuring their decay time, to understand distances and be able to measure the redshift of those stars. So and then you can measure that, compare that to the redshift of these stars, and get a measure of the Hubble constant. And that project was a failure. And the reason why it was a failure was the Hubble constant turned out not to be a constant. Uh, I, I was at CERN when these results were first presented. There was an auditorium twice the size of this. Every scientist in the room was hostile to this result and challenged them. I mean, there was just an hour of questions and bombarding them. But it turns out, it was right, there's another way of looking at it. And if, if the Hubble constant was constant, then on this plot, this lower curve should be where all the data points lie. And in fact, they don't. So the Hubble constant isn't a constant. And in fact, this has been measured many times over now in a variety of ways. And the results keep coming back the same. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. So certainly when I was a kid in school, I was taught that there was a big bang and then gravity slows down the expansion of the universe and eventually it'll peter out. Well, that was wrong. The expansion of the universe is speeding up. The data just keep back, coming back telling us that. It's as if the universe is pervaded with some sort of dark energy that pervades it and is adding energy to the system and blowing it apart. And in fact, it gets worse than that. Like, that's not bad enough as it is. Other measurements you can do with the Hubble Space Telescope tells us that not only is the universe filled with dark energy, but dark matter. For example, if you look at our own galaxy and how the spiral arms in our galaxy are rotating around, you can't understand it unless invoking that there's much more mass out there in terms of dark energy, some sort of unidentified form of matter. Okay? Other measurements include gravitational lensing. There's a whole slew of results. So we have no idea what 95% of the universe is made out of. It's 25% dark matter, 70% dark energy. The universe is expanding. We have no clue what's going on, and this I consider an epic failure. We have a complete misunderstanding of how the universe works. Now, there's a common thread in all these examples I've given you. A great scientific instrument is built. Um, in the case of the Hubble, there's a flaw in the instrument, but it's still great. It gets fixed, and it's greater. And it shows we don't know what the universe is made of. A, a tremendous failure in our understanding. So what's next? And what's next is something that, again, has a connection with Rice and with lots of other institutions and with people in our department and what we're doing. So this is the shameless self-promotion part of the talk. Okay? Now, I'm an experimental particle physicist, as you were told. And what do we do? We study the elementary constituents of the universe and the forces that govern them. If the goal of experimental particle physics is understanding the fundamental constituents of the universe, and I just told you we don't know what the universe is made out of, well, then particle physics is a field of research that has just completely failed. We don't know what we're doing. And that's a good thing. That's an opportunity for discovery. And that's what we want to do. And that's what the LHC is all about, trying to figure that out. OK? We have something called the standard model of particle physics. And every laboratory experiment that's been confirmed since the 1970s has been consistent with this model that we've built up. And yet we already know that this model must be wrong because it doesn't explain what we're seeing in the universe. So there's something fundamental that we're not understanding. And the goal of the LHC is to destroy our understanding of physics and the standard model of particle physics. 
we want to change our understanding of nature. And the basic idea of what we're doing at the LHC is to take two protons and use E equals mc squared uh, when we smash them together and make new stuff. And it's a little bit like taking two strawberries, slamming them together, and getting a bowl of fruit coming out. <laughs> and as the Economist website put it, physicists hope the ensuing orgy of creative destruction produces fleeting exotic parts. I've never, I've never been accused of indulging in an orgy before, but the Economist <laughs> magazine came up with that. Now, not all the press has been positive. And I thought, well, he, uh, I've lost my. The Large Hadron Collider promises to reveal the smallest building blocks of nature by recreating conditions that existed moments after the Big Bang. This begs the question why the f would you recreate the Big Bang? Does that not sound a bit <laughs> dangerous? <laughs> and, 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 and actually, that episode of The Daily Show is probably better than anything you'll ever see on any press website about what goes on. And it goes on to, sh while making fun of the physicists, show how ludicrous these claims that we would destroy the universe are. Uh, and, and the way we know the collisions at the LHC are not dangerous is we're not doing anything that hasn't happened before. The Earth is being bombarded by cosmic rays all the time. There are muons and cosmic rays going through you right now as you're sitting there. And calculations say that at least a million LHC-like experiments are being done on Earth by these cosmic rays hitting us. And we're still here. So if one of these collisions was going to destroy the Earth, it would have happened. And the reason why we don't study the cosmic rays is we would have to build a detector that instruments the atmosphere. And we've already spent $10 billion just instrumenting this smaller thing. Imagine what that would cost. It's not practical. OK, so we want to make collisions. We're going to collide protons together, makes new stuff, watch it fly out in our detectors, and try to figure out what's going on. And what we hope to do is make the stuff the universe is made out of, that 95% that we haven't seen and don't understand. Try to make it in the laboratory. So we've built something. We've built a particle. There's a particle accelerator. Uh, this, is, this is hard to see, but this is outside Geneva, Switzerland. There's a 60-mile tunnel, 100 meters underground, where we're going to send trillions of protons around, or we are sending trillions of protons around. Um, they go around that ring 11,000 times a second. It's like 0.99991 times the speed of light. Um, the biggest, most complex detectors ever built are being used to study the tiniest particles and the smallest things that have ever been studied. And we're studying them with incredible precision. We have superconducting magnets. They're operating you know, down close to absolute zero running with liquid helium. We actually have a vacuum that's colder than outer space. We have, the, in the collisions, hottest temperatures has ever been created by humans. It's about a billion times hotter than the center of the sun when you get one of these collisions. Uh, we tr send these particles around the beams in a vacuum that's got less atmosphere than what you find on the moon. And in order to study the data for that, we've had to build one of the world's largest computing systems. We have a computing system that spans the globe. I don't know how many of you know it, but the World Wide Web that we all hold near and dear to our hearts was invented at CERN so that the particle physicists working on these big international collaborations could communicate with each other and share information. Um, we have 170 computing sites in 34 countries, about 100,000 processors running, looking at the data. It's a global adventure. So at the LHC, there's been more than 10,000 people from 60 countries working on it. In the US, there's about 1,700 scientists and engineers who have worked. There's 89 universities involved. You often hear in the press that the, you know, the LHC is a European experiment. Well, 
There's 89 U.S. universities and 1,700 scientists from the U.S. and students and engineers working. There's seven national laboratories in the U.S. involved, 32 states and Puerto Rico all involved in that. The experiment I work on and my colleagues here at Rice has 3,600 people working on it, 180 institutions, 38 countries. So when I give a talk, you know, when, when you give a talk, you name your collaborators. <laughs> and then our collaborations got big, so we started naming the institutions we work with. And then they got even bigger, and we named the countries we work with. I'm down to continents. <laughs> So in our experiment, there's about 1,000 uh, US-based people working on it, a couple hundred students, 49 universities, Puerto Rico, 23 states. And we're training tomorrow's scientists. So when I go and talk, lots of people in the public are interested about what, in what we're doing at the LHC. Um, there's over 375 graduate students working on LHC research. Undergraduates from Rice have worked on the LHC. We've been sending our students and postdocs and faculty to the LHC for about 15 years. There are two big experiments that are trying to study the sorts of fundamental questions I'm talking about. ATLAS and CMS, compact muon solenoid. Now when I say compact, that's a relative term. Our experiments merely five stories high, okay? So it's the size of a building. Um, Atlas is bigger, but, but CMS weighs a lot more, and for some reason I was compelled to work on it, and I don't understand that, but okay. So these are weighty experiments. So let's just look at the compact muon solenoid. There's a person for scale. Okay, so this is an exploded view of the detector. It's five stories up this way, comparable size in this direction. It's exploded out in this picture. It weighs 12,500 tons. And it's layers of highly instrumented device. This whole thing is packed full of instrumentation to watch what's going on. This device here in gray, that's a superconducting solenoid. That is the strongest magnetic field solenoid of magnetic field ever created in terms of stored energy. The stored energy in that magnetic field is equivalent to the kinetic energy of a 747 in flight. You turn it off and on really carefully or you will have an epic failure. So we began construction of the experiment in 1998. The first thing we discovered were archaeological ruins which was absolutely terrifying because that can shut you down for a long time. Um, turns out they weren't very significant. And so, you know, the archaeologists got to work with them and there's some deal at some point we have to display them. This is a big hall on the surface where the experiment was assembled and then lowered piece by piece 100 meters underground down that hole there. There was a building put over this one shot. Here's the hall underground when it was being constructed. Here it is after it was constructed uh, before we put in the instruments. And what, what you can never get in these pictures is a sense of scale. I mean, when you look at pictures of this detector, it doesn't really capture how immense and how incredible this thing is. I mean, I've worked on big experiments around the world, and I remember the first time I went in there and just went, holy. I mean, it was just phenomenal what it was like. Um, here's a piece of apparatus that I've worked on for 15 years. Notice the people down here for scale. This is just one little <laughs> slice of the detector. Okay, here's some other slices of the detector. Here's that big magnet that I was talking about. Here it is being lowered down. That's a 1,700 ton piece of apparatus being lowered 100 meters underground. Lord. Down, and then we had to go through this incredible dance of moving these things around. There are and you can move them around. Push everything into position. All right, your microphone. Oh, ah. 
Like I said, lots of students from Rice have gone there. Here are students who got, you know, they got lucky in the lottery and got to fly there and help build this thing. There's a couple more Rice undergraduates, uh, some more students who were over there. Uh, here's our current postdocs. We're there. He's actually landing today from Geneva because we have a grant review this week. Uh, here's our other postdoc, Laria. Uh, we have engineers working here. Uh, you know, these are two engineers, both have PhDs. Uh, Rice faculty have been going there. There's my colleague Jay Roberts helping install some of the stuff. There's me just looking important. <laughs> uh, Frank Gertz and Carl Eklund who are here in the audience. Uh, I don't know what Frank's doing. <laughs> Rice has played a very important role. These people you've seen are only a fraction of the people who over the years have contributed to the building of the LHC. We've built lots of complex electronics. Um, we've built software systems here at Rice. We built them here at Rice and then shipped them over there for installation. And we're playing an important role in analyzing the data that's coming out. And it's great to be part of such an international collaboration. Okay? Our students, our postdocs, our engineers, our faculty have an international presence through this collaboration. Scientists around the world know who we are and use our expertise every day. Actually, it turns out this morning, people from Beijing were emailing me asking for help for getting involvement into sort of a next stage. We're already worried about improving the experiment, building upgrades. And what a wonderful educational experience for our people, be working as part of an international team with people from around the globe. So in September 2008, the the apparatus turned on, the beams were fired up, the detectors were fired up, and there was a celebration. And on September 19th, we broke it. <laughs> uh, there was a soldering mistake in some of the interconnections between superconducting magnets and the accelerator. And this led to a failure mode that had not been adequately designed for. Tons of helium were released in an event that vaporized the inside. So what the official statement from, right, from the LHC always says is that there was an incident that caused the vaporization of materials, that led to ruptures, that caused the rapid release of helium, and the displacement of many magnets and components. Notice I never said explosion. No, no, we didn't have an explosion. <laughs> Froze the air in the tunnel. That's how cold it was from all the liquid helium. So. Yeah, we've experienced failure. <laughs> um, so through 2009, there was a set of repairs that were done. You don't have to worry about the details of them. And now the experiment is up and running. And we're going and we're taking data. So, so here's this big experiment. Look at the person for scale. And then here's an animation of what happens. Oh. So what we're going to see are beams of protons coming in. Come on, protons. I'm sorry. I, and then they collide. Let's just, I only rehearsed this four times. OK, so the beams of protons come in. Protons interact, they smash into each other in the middle, energy is created, and then matter particles are made from that energy and come flying out. And all this detector and instrumentation is to measure those particles come flying out. Okay, so there's sort of what happens in a collision. And here's some snapshots of collisions that we've seen. So you can think of one of these experiments as a big camera taking snapshots like this. And it does it 40 million times a second. The raw data rate from this experiment, after suppressing all the zeros, is 40 terabytes of data a second. And we troll through that looking for signals of interest, trying to understand the origins of the universe. It's such a phenomenal intellectual challenge to be confronted with so much data and try and understand it. Now, you've probably all heard that one of the things we're going to do is find the Higgs boson. 
And it's a crucial component in our understanding of nature. It's conjecture to give all the fundamental particles their masses. And so one of the goals is to find the Higgs boson. But failure would be much more interesting. Failing to find the Higgs boson would be an even greater achievement. It would undermine our understanding of nature. And we would have to come up with a new understanding of how the building blocks of the universe work. That would be an even more interesting outcome. Of course, another interesting outcome would be to measure some of those dark matter particles or figure out what dark energy is. Uh, there's a huge number of physics analyses underway. Um, there's, you know, we're having trouble keeping track with all the physics results. Uh, ben and Bean coming out. Yeah, some, you know, an initial thing we did is we actually reproduced the standard model. All these resonances, all you <coughs> lines you see in the spectra are things that were known to exist. If you're finding new stuff, you'd better be able to find the old stuff that existed before. We've searched for black holes in our data. So if black holes were being created in the experiment and then they were radiating by Hawking radiation, what you would see in this distribution is some distribution of the data where it comes out enhanced out here at higher values of this quantity. And we don't see that. Now here's another interesting result that's come out. This plot I'm showing here, and don't worry about what it is we're plotting. It would you know, take 15 minutes to explain it. This is a theoretical prediction of what and the quantities that were plotted when this plot was made of how they should look like. And here's what we saw in the data. And there are structures in there that were not predicted by theory. So this is actually our first example of a theory failure confronting the data at the LHC. Probably not, almost certainly not a fundamental theoretical problem, but rather a calculational difficulty. Um, but actually what's going on there is an active point of discussion in the physics community. <coughs> many, many more results are coming. We expect that for the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to be producing interesting results. And it's my expectation, and I'm not unique in this opinion, that 20 years from now, we'll have understood how our present under description of nature is a failure. And we'll have a new picture of how the universe works. So I just want to conclude on a philosophical note, the PH and PhDs for philosophy after all. So I actually have a license to do this. And, and the popular image of science is that theorists think up great ideas and experimentalists confirm or reject them. That isn't how it usually is. Experimentalists may build an apparatus to test a particular theory. They may fail to confirm that theory. But then they find something else interesting, and they chase that, and confusion ensues, and something unexpected happens. And eventually, it all gets figured out. And that's more likely how things will be at the LHC. I know there are books about string theory and M theory and parallel universes and that. Probably all those are wrong. Probably we'll find something completely different. And 20 years from now, somebody will be giving a talk on failure and say, what a failure all those theorists were back then. So failure is a key step in our understanding of nature. And uh, my hope and our hope is that at the LHC, we're going to give rise to some spectac spectacular failures in our understanding. So thanks for the invitation. I had fun preparing the talk, fun giving it. I hope it was good for you, too. is still dropping from that talk. That was so fantastic. So Paul has agreed to take questions, and we're not going to run the microphones because it takes a long time to get up to the top, and the, uh, we want to get questions from all over, but Paul will have to repeat the question. Give him time to do that because we are videoing this and we want to hear your questions. So. Okay. So. How's all this funded? How's all this funded? Um, so within the U.S., the U.S. contributed... So overall, the project is about $10 billion. Uh, U.S. contribution has been on the order of about a $1 billion. The, the annual budget within the U.S. is about $100 million a year to maintain our participation in it. And uh, yeah, it's a combination of the Department of Energy and National Science Foundation. And we're sweating what the Republicans in Congress are trying to do because that budget could vanish in a few weeks if they get their way. Yeah. Is there good justification 
for assuming that by smashing particles we know about, we can find out about things we know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> So the question is, is there good justification by trying to un about trying to understand things that we have? We're trying to understand that 95% by slamming together things uh, we know about. And the point is, when we slam together those things that we know about, what we're do it's actually not those things that's interesting. It's the energy at which they're colliding. What we're doing is using E equals mc squared, creating a state of very high energy. And then because E equals mc squared, we make new matter particles that come flying out. And we're doing that at energies that have never been done in the laboratory before. Every time in the past when we've gone up in energy, we've found new things. And so there's another school of thought that in fact what we should be doing is building detectors that directly detect these dark matter particles that should be all around us. And that's another line of research, and it's equally valid. I'm, I've put my money on one approach, but there's certainly a large community trying the other approach. And it's great. We should take both approaches. Yeah? How badly do you have to fail in order to fail? Like Michael Saporni failed really badly. I mean, they failed nothing. It, yeah, so the question is, how, how badly do you have to fail to know that you, that you <laughs> failed? And that's actually a very profound question. How do you confirm a null result? And in fact, you never definitively confirm a null result. People are still doing the Michelson-Morley experiment and still shrinking down the precision on that measurement. Now, some of the things what happens is with, say, for the Higgs boson, in the standard model, there are def definite predictions about how many should be produced. and. Um, and so we can, from those predictions, we can certainly rule out a standard model Higgs boson definitively. Is there some other type of Higgs boson that doesn't fit the standard model? That would be harder to rule out. Likewise with all these theories. So what we do is we set limits on how much of this stuff we're making. And at some point, they become theoretically uninteresting. If you're making it at too low a rate, then you can't be explaining the dark matter in the universe, for example. And so you have to, all you can do is set limits. Uh, but, but that's in part, you know, I say 10 to 20 years. If, if you're trying to prove a negative result, then it takes a lot longer than seeing a brand new signal. Yeah. These, these large instruments are built on Earth, so there's a gravitational attraction of certain I wonder if it would make any difference if they were out in space somewhere. I mean, what effect does gravity have on any of this? You didn't mention gravity, but I was trying to figure out how so, to So it turns out. In these interactions, and, and we, we, we can do an experiment, and I'll show you the point. Oh, so the question is, uh, why isn't gravity coming into play and in doing our experiments? Why isn't that affecting our results? It has a direct effect, actually, on the detector. I mean, that's you know, 17,000 tons of detector. It, it feels gravity, and it sags, and the detector all moves, and there's all kinds of engineering problems. But watch what happens when I throw this eraser up in the air. It leaves my hands, and once it leaves my hands, it's only feeling the force of gravity. And slowly it turns around and it comes back down. Now when I drop it down, it comes down and it just comes down and <laughs> hits the surface and stops right away. And the reason why it does that is the electromagnetic force, the other forces of nature are 40 orders of magnitude stronger than the force of gravity. And so the other forces we're playing with in these experiments are 40 orders of magnitude stronger than the force of gravity. And so we expect them not to come into play in the standard model. Where the predictions of black holes comes about is people have models where, in fact, gravity does become important. And gravitational interactions come into play. And then, in principle and you know, multidimensional theories, gravity could become strong. And in fact, we would have gravitational interactions. And so that's why some people predicted we'd make black holes. Um, and we indeed may make black holes, but we know they won't be dangerous because we're still here. They evaporate or something happens to them to make them not dangerous.
<laughs> and, and, and so there are social scientists who have studied how this goes about, and it's and it's not. Um, I mean, we could, you know, I don't really fully understand the process, even though being part of it. And there is some little sub piece of it that I lead, but, but that leadership was kind of handed to me. So, you know, it, it already existed. I certainly know for that sub piece, there was a leader of that sub piece who went around recruiting good people into work. And part of your job as a leader is to recruit good people in. Um, what's clear is that if you poll a community of particle physicists, we all know there's something fundamentally wrong with what we're doing and that we have to do an experiment to resolve it. And, and a large fraction of the community is driven by this, you know, I wander around. I mean, what's the universe made of? What's the universe made of? What's the universe? I mean, it makes no sense. And we're compelled by that. And so isn't it wonderful that you have people from India, Pakistan, China, Russia, uh, the United States, France, Italy, Germany, all so compelled by that question that they choose to work together. And somehow the community comes to consensus that this was what needs to be done. They make the cases to all the respective governments. And, and you know, it's not by complete coincidence. CERN was formed after the Second World War to get France and Germany and Italy and England working together on common goals of, you know, uh, in the scientific enterprises because I, I think they've had a little trouble getting along historically. <laughs> yes? I guess I, I have a question about Einstein. For those of us who are not scientists, he's so huge, such a huge presence, um, almost a romantic, uh, heroic presence. And I'm wondering if science has changed in such a way that it's not possible any longer to have a figure like that who all by himself could make... Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's a fantastic question. So the question is, could we have an individual standout character like Einstein in this era where we have to do great big experiments? And I'll put it even more selfishly, personally. If we just discovers something of Nobel Prize worthy merit. Say we do change the view of the universe. Who gets the Nobel Prize? They won't give the Nobel Prize in physics to more than three people and never have. And, and, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be one of the three people, but I have a good chance of being on an experiment that will do that sort of work. And, and it's a very interesting problem. Now it may turn out that there's some theorist who sorts out all the crazy things that we get from the data, and there's clarity, and that person becomes esteemed. Uh, so I think it's more of an issue on the experimental side, where these Herculean efforts are needed to do these experiments. All the easy things are being done. And so I advocate group awards of the Nobel Prize. But OK, I'm, I'm biased. Yeah. In the last round, but I'm gonna buy real estate in Dallas. I'm still <laughs> trying to unload a house. So, so I did unload my house in Dallas. If we had that instrument, would we be seeing different things or anything? So the question is, if we had the super colliding, super conducting super collider, and I was one of the scientists at that project, that's what brought me to Texas. So I, I. I left wonderful cold Canada to come to Dallas to work on the superconducting super collider, bought a house, and Congress voted to shut it down like three weeks later. <laughs> I learned so much about the American political system and, uh, okay. Um, we would have the answers. If that project had gone ahead, I wouldn't be talking to you about what we could do I'd be talking to you about what we have done. Okay, it would have reached higher in energy, but probably investigated the same things. Uh, but I'm 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 a forward-looking person, so that that's the past. I think there was a you know political mistake that was made to kill that. So you push on. I want to find out what the universe is made out of. Whether I do that in Dallas or in CERN Geneva, 
I don't care. I think the public should care. The American public would hopefully want it to be done in the US. But OK, that's behind us. We're going to do it at CERN. Um. Well, uh, I just want to thank Paul for a perfectly stunning talk. I cannot remember a talk that has moved us to that sort of central animating position of why we do science, not for the satisfactions of safe, normal science where the answers always come out right, but for that incredibly exciting moment where something ex unexpected comes along and we realize we're in new terrain and this is what drives most of us to do what we do and you captured that so wonderfully. So thank and, you very much. In the meantime, if we got it wrong, thank God for tenure. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So thank you all for coming. Please join us at the reception. This program is protected by a copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice Digital Media Services.